Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics of Robert Sylvester Kelly and the Chicago trial that is going on as we speak. This was the opening arguments today, Wednesday, uh, August the 17th, and there was a lot of things going on in the courtroom. I do want to start off by reporting and sharing commentary on this statement right here. Let's go to, I want to say this is Fox 32 Chicago. Here we go. Just weeks after being sentenced to 30 years in prison, R&B singer R. Kelly back in a federal courtroom here in Chicago. Jury selection got underway today at his trial for allegedly having sex with a number of underage girls during his music career. That's right. Fox 32's Dane Placco reports many of the prospective jurors have heard of Kelly's troubles. Wearing a charcoal gray suit, glasses, and a considerable amount of new weight, singer R. Kelly stood before a pool of prospective jurors at the Dirksen Federal Courthouse. Six weeks ago, a federal judge in New York sentenced Kelly to 30 years in prison for a slew of underage sex crimes. Here in Chicago, he's been charged with child pornography, obstruction of justice, and the enticement of minors into criminal sexual activity. Prosecutors say they'll present testimony from a number of women who were as young as 13 when they say they had sex with Kelly, which he frequently videotaped. Kelly's defense attorney, Jennifer Bonjean, asked the judge to exclude any jurors who had watched the Netflix docuseries Surviving R. Kelly that aired in 2019 and 2020. If someone has seen all six episodes of Surviving R. Kelly, which, by the way, includes testimonials and interviews with people who are going to take the stand, it would be impossible to separate out, what did I hear? What did I hear during the documentary versus what am I hearing now? Uh, it, it's, it's kind of the standard. If jurors say they can put it aside and be fair, judges, especially in federal court, are reluctant to excuse them from jury service. Also on trial with Kelly are two co-defendants, Daryl McDavid and Milton June Brown, both former employees who allegedly helped Kelly cover up his crimes and pressured victims to not testify during the 2008 criminal trial in which Kelly was acquitted. By the end of the day, more than 60 prospective jurors had been questioned. About a third of them dismissed by the judge when they said they didn't feel they could give Kelly a fair trial. Opening statements are scheduled to start on Wednesday, and the trial should take about a month. At the Dirksen Federal Building, Dane Placco, Fox 32 Chicago. That's what I want you to know about what's going on today. Also, I want to also share with you a portion of a clip that attorneys don't accept portrayal of R. Kelly um, as a monster. Bonjean came down about 24 minutes ago and said um, in the Chicago newspaper, R. Kelly kept, oh, okay, this is what the clip is saying. The article is saying itself. R. Kelly kept an ugly side of his life hidden as he escaped poverty in Chicago and rose to pop music stardom. A prosecutor told jurors today at the singer's trial on charges accusing him of enticing girls for sex and rigging a 2008 child pornography case. Kelly's lead attorney implored jurors during her opening statement at the federal trial in Chicago not to accept what she said was the prosecution's portrayal of her client as a monster. Going back to the 1990s, much of the world knew Kelly solely by his hit songs, including the chart-topping inspirational anthem, I Believe I Can Fly. U.S. Assistant Attorney Jason Julian said, but Kelly had another side, a hidden side, a dark side. He added, this trial is about Kelly's hidden side. Kelly 55 faces multiple charges, including enticing of minors and producing child pornography and rigging his 2008 child pornography trial at which he was acquitted. Kelly, who was denied, Kelly has denied any wrongdoing, has been trailed for decades by complaints and allegations about his sexual behavior. The scrutiny intensified after the Me Too era and the 2019 six-part documentary series of R. Kelly, 
that detail sex abuse allegations involving women and teenage girls. Defense attorney Jennifer Bonjean told jurors that Kelly, in part because of intellectual challenges that included illiteracy, was forced to rely on others as his career took off and that he was sometimes led astray by those in his circle of associates. Mr. Kelly can also be a victim, she said. A conviction in Chicago could add decades to a 30-year prison sentence he already received from a New York federal judge for charges that he used his fame and sexually abused um, other young fans. Sitting at a defense table as the prosecutor spoke, Kelly occasionally shook his head as Jillian described Kelly manipulating and controlling girls, even beating them if they didn't comply with the strict rules. So that was a news article that was just sent out I'm going to say 25 minutes ago because of the fact that he was, um, it was already started with the opening arguments today. Now I want to go back over to the text details of, um, let me see here. I want to read some more about the jury and the selection, um, beyond the selection. Now we're moving into the trial handbook by the American Bar Association, and we're going to go to the juror's solemn oath, what they're saying, what they're swearing to after the void deer is completed. So let's move on to that. After the voir dire is completed, the jurors selected to try the case will be sworn in. The judge or the clerk will state to the jury, Members of the jury, you will rise, hold up your right hands, and be sworn to try this case. The jurors then rise and hold up their right hands. The jurors face the judge or the clerk who is to administer the oath. That if it, after the arguments of counsel, after presentation of the evidence is completed, the lawyers have the opportunity to discuss the evidence in their closing arguments. This helps the jurors recall testimony that might have slipped their memory. The chief purpose of the argument is to present the evidence in logical and comprehensible order. The lawyers fit the different parts of the testimony together and connect up the facts. Each attorney presents the view of the case that is most favorable to his or her own client. Each lawyer's side appears to be right to that lawyer. Each lawyer's statement may be balanced by the statement of the lawyers on the other side. The charge to the jury. The charge of a judge to a jury in a United States District Court frequently is much more than a statement of the rules of law. Sometimes it may contain a summary of the a, facts or some of the facts. It is the jury's duty to reach its own conclusion based on the evidence. The verdict is reached without regard to what may be the opinion of the judges to the facts, though as to the law the judge's charge controls. The judge may point out and may also explain basic facts in dispute and facts that do not actually matter in the case. In other words, the judge may try to direct the jury's attention to the real merits of the case and impartially summarize the evidence bearing on the questions of fact. The judge will state the law related to the facts presented to the jury. The jury's verdict. In both civil and criminal cases, it is the jury's duty to decide the facts in accordance with the principles of law laid down in the judge's charge to the jury. The decision is made on the evidence introduced, and the jury's decision on the facts is usually final. Courtroom etiquette. A court session begins when the court official wraps for order. Everyone in the court rises. The judge takes his or her place on the bench, and the court official announces the opening of court. A similar procedure is used when court adjourns. Common as to the way jurors should act. Of course, no juror will be permitted to read a newspaper or magazine in the courtroom. Nor should a juror carry on a conversation with another juror in the courtroom during the trial. Jurors will be treated with consideration for their comfort and convenience. They should bring to the attention of the judge any matter affecting their service and should notify the court of any emergencies. In the event of a personal emergency, a juror may send word to the judge through any court personnel or may ask to see the judge privately. Conduct of the jury during the trial. Jurors should give close attention to the testimony. They are sworn to disregard their prejudices and follow the court's instructions. They must render a verdict according to their best judgment. Each juror should keep an open mind. 
Human experience shows that once persons come to a preliminary conclusion as to a set of facts, they hesitate to change their views. Therefore, it is wise for jurors not to even attempt to make up their mind on the facts of a case until all the evidence has been presented to them, and they have been instructed on the law applicable to the case. Similarly, jurors should not discuss the case even among themselves until it is concluded. During the trial, the jury may hear references to the rules of evidence. Some of these rules may appear strange to a person who is not a lawyer. However, each rule has a purpose. The rules have evolved from hundreds of years of experience in the trial of cases. The mere fact that a lawsuit was begun is not evidence in a case. The opening and closing statements of the lawyers are not evidence. A jury should disregard any statements made by a lawyer in argument that have not been proved by the evidence. A juror should also disregard any statement by a lawyer as to the law of the case if it is not in accord with the judge's instructions. Jurors are expected to use all the experience, common sense, and common knowledge they possess. But they are not to rely on any private source of information. Thus, they should be careful during the trial not to discuss the case at home or elsewhere. Information that a juror gets from a private source relevant to the case at hand. At any rate, it is only fair that the parties have a chance to know and comment on all the facts that matter in the case. If during the trial a juror learns elsewhere of some fact about the case, he or she should inform the court. The juror should not mention any such matter in the jury room. Individual jurors should never inspect the scene of an accident or of any event in the case. If an inspection is necessary, the judge will have the jurors go as a group to the scene. Jurors must not talk about the case with others not on the jury, even their spouses or families, including via electronic communications and social networking on computers, netbooks, tablets, and smartphones. Jurors must not read about the case in the news. Jurors must not read about the case in the newspapers or on the internet. They should avoid radio, television, and internet broadcasts that might mention the case. Jurors should not conduct any outside research, including but not limited to, consulting dictionaries or reference materials, whether in paper form or on the internet. Jurors may not use any of the following to obtain information about the case, about case processes or legal terms, or to conduct any research about the case, any electronic device or media, such as a telephone, cell phone, smartphone, or computer, the internet, any internet service, or any text. 11 or instant messaging service, RSS feed, or other automatic alert that may transmit information regarding the case to the juror, or any internet chat room, blog, or website to communicate to anyone information about the case. The Sixth Amendment's guarantee of a trial by an impartial jury requires that a jury's verdict must be based on nothing else but the evidence and law presented to them in court. The words of Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes from over a century ago apply with equal force to jurors serving in this advanced technological age. The theory of our system is that the conclusions to be reached in a case will be induced only by evidence and argument in open court, and not by any outside influence, whether of private talk or public print. Breaking these rules is likely to confuse a juror. It may be hard to separate in one's mind the court testimony and reports coming from other sources. Jurors should not loiter in the corridors or vestibules of the courthouse. Embarrassing and or improper contacts may occur there with persons interested in the case. If juror identification badges are provided, they should be worn in the courthouse at all times. If any outsider attempts to talk with a juror about a case in which he or she is sitting, the juror should do the following. Tell the person it is improper for a juror to discuss the case or receive any information except in the courtroom. Refuse to listen if the outsider persists. Report the incident at once to the judge. Jurors on a case should refrain from talking on any subject, even if it is not related to the matter being tried, with any lawyer, witness, or party in the case. Such contact may make a new trial necessary, at significant additional expense to the parties, the court, and ultimately, taxpayers. Some cases may arouse much public discussion. In that event, the jury may be kept together until the verdict is reached. This procedure is used to protect the jurors against outside influences. In the jury room. In some districts, the judge selects the foreperson of the jury. In other districts, the jurors elect their foreperson, and in still other districts, the first juror to enter the jury box becomes the foreperson automatically.
The judge will inform jurors which method is used in the district. The foreperson presides over the jury's deliberations and must give every juror a fair opportunity to express his or her views. Jurors must enter the discussion with open minds. They should freely exchange views. They should not hesitate to change their opinions if the deliberations have convinced them they were wrong initially. In a criminal case, all jurors must agree on the verdict. This is also required in a civil case, unless the jury is otherwise instructed by the court. The jurors have a duty to give full consideration to the opinion of their fellow jurors. They have an obligation to reach a verdict whenever possible. However, no juror is required to give up any opinion which he or she is convinced is correct. It would be dishonest for a judge to decide a case by tossing a coin. It would be just as dishonest for a juror to do so. The members of the jury are sworn to pass judgment on the facts in a particular case. They have no concern beyond that case. They violate their oath if they render their decision on the basis of the effect their verdict may have on other situations. After the trial. After the jurors return their verdict and are dismissed by the judge, they are free to go about their normal affairs, although in some districts jurors must check with jury office personnel to see if their service is concluded. They are under no obligation to speak to any person about the case and may refuse all requests for interviews or comments. Nevertheless, the court may enter an order in a specific case that during any such interview, jurors may not give any information with respect to the vote of any other juror. Conclusion To decide cases correctly, jurors must be honest and intelligent. They must have both integrity and good judgment. The continued vitality of the jury system depends on these attributes. To meet their responsibility, jurors must decide the facts and apply the law impartially. They must not favor the rich or the poor. They must treat alike all men and women, corporations and individuals. Justice should be 14. Rendered to all persons without regard to race, color, religion or sex. The performance of jury service is the fulfillment of a high civic obligation. Conscientious service brings its own reward in the satisfaction of an important task well done. There is no more valuable work that the average citizen can perform in support of our government than the full and honest discharge of jury duty. The effectiveness of a democratic system itself is largely measured by the integrity, the intelligence, and the general quality of citizenship of the jurors who serve in our courts. Thank you. So that is a re reporting by the American Bar Association through the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, Thurgood Marshall Federal Judiciary Building, Juan Columbus Circle, Northeast, Washington, D.C., 20544, under www.uscourts.gov. So I want to also let you hear a video from Chicago. Let me see here. Give me one second. Okay, this is a recording of local news. Prosecutors tell R. Kelly's jury singers hidden side as defense urges them to reject portrayal as monster. This is by Mungo Odigwe and Tamara Molina, um, and it's for today, so let's listen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the latest Chicago trial of we the left. famed R&B star R. Kelly. CBS 2's Mugo Odigwe is live at the Dirksen Federal Courthouse. Mugo, this trial already off to a very shaky start. Very shaky start indeed, Ryan. So you had one juror who said she had some leg problems, and so she was dismissed and replaced by an alternate. And then you had two other jurors who were stuck on a train. All of that delayed court proceedings this morning by at least 35 minutes. But as of right now, we know opening statements have now started. We're also told it is expected to last about three hours. Federal prosecutors, Kelly's defense team, along with attorneys for both his former business manager and another associate are expected to speak. Now, Kelly is facing child pornography and obstruction of justice charges. Federal prosecutors say he and his associates rigged his 2008 child pornography trial in Cook County. They're accused of bribing and intimidating witnesses. That includes a teenage girl whom he allegedly sexually assaulted on videotape. Now, Kelly was acquitted in that trial. Now, that teenage girl who is in her 30s is expected to testify against Kelly. Now, remember, Kelly is already sentenced to 30 years 
years in prison for a federal sex trafficking case out of New York. He would face a minimum of 10 more years if convicted of the charges in his hometown of Chicago with the potential for decades more. Now, our Tara Molina is in court as we speak. She'll have much more on what happened in court today during our afternoon newscast. We're live outside the Dirksen Federal Courthouse. Mugo Dikwe, CBS 2 News. So that is what I wanted to present to you today. Um, not a lot to report. You know, the void deer is on the docket. Um, I do have something to also state to those who are coming on, putting their comments in the comment box. If I have not officially welcomed you to the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel, for whatever your reasons are, please do not solicit your channel on my on my platform um because i don't want to sway my viewers and i've had to actually block two individuals today who have you know came on talking about reading of dockets and motions filing this is a legal channel so we're already going to do that over here if they haven't already met you which they should have because we've gone through a whole federal Brooklyn trial as well as going into midpoint of a Chicago trial. So if you are on YouTube in any area of the word or of the area of R. Kelly, I'm sure my subscribers have already connected with you. And if they wanted to, they would definitely go to your channel. So please don't do to this channel what I don't do to yours. I will never go over to anyone's channel to solicit anything related to coming to our Kelly Appeal TV. So let's be respectful to this or you will be disrespected by getting blocked. Okay, so I just wanted to put this out here for everyone to get their comments and their views about what they're feeling right now. I mean, as far as you know. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff going on even in our personal lives. It's just super crazy how everything is just coming to the surface, just coming out. Let it come out. You know, let it come out. Because what's done in the dark will come to the light anyway. So if you have people manipulating the system as victims and being forced into cooperating with the government to, you know, say things that are not true. You know, those things will come out. We'll see it. We'll see it all come out because guess what? Bonjean is in the same room that <laughs> prosecution is in. In the same room. You know, um, I heard that R. Kelly has gained a little bit of weight. Of course, that's all you have to do when you sit around and you're not able to be productive. You know, when someone else is, you know, doing what they do. So we'll just keep you posted on the remainder of what's going on. Um, let me see. There was some parts of the jury selection today that I read where, you know, the individual was laid on the transit and she had to be replaced. Another person had leg issues and they had to be replaced. So that's what happens when you try to push someone to do something. Something will happen physically to make this unable to go forth. So alternatives are there. Alternates are there, um, you know. Bon Jean is there, you know, the judge, the, the, the judge is doing his part with prosecution. So we already know what that's about. So we need not be confused or, or like whatever. We can't be upset about going to their court and them having their way. Let them have their way. So with that, Thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. And again, let's, you know, keep our Kelly Appeal TV as it is. We have uh, universities that's working with us. 
very professional individuals. And um, I'm not affiliated with anyone here on YouTube relating to R. Kelly um, in any way, shape or form. I do send shout outs to maybe one or two people. But other than that, I stay in my on my own platform. And that's what I do. I open my stage and I stay on my platform and I am not affiliated in any way, shape or form, nor do I propagandize any, you know, person other than Facebook um, celebrating R. Kelly and maybe, you know, one or two other people that come on to my platform and say hello to me. I will send a shout out to them, but I'm not even doing lives anymore. So that won't be happening unless we're having an actual one-on-one -on -one conversation with the individual. So you don't have to worry about that. I try to keep my moderators very, very um, connected to my chat because I know that some people bring certain things into the chat that is just not part of our Kelly Appeal TV. But of course, you know, that's the way of the world. That's the way of the world. I can't prevent that. But what I can do is when I see it, block them forever. They'll just have to keep making fake accounts. But hey, they'll get tired of doing that too. <laughs> so thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. God bless you, Robert. What you're going through is only a test of your faith. It's going to make you stronger. It will make you stronger. Just keep holding on and keep knowing that this too shall pass. Mm hmm. Sooner or later, we'll hit that appeal or it'll be acquitted. And I don't, you know, I don't know how it's going to go. All I do know is that the jury is the only one at this point who can say guilty or not guilty. So let's continue to say our positive attributes to them, that they make the right decision, that they're you know, honorable in their, the rules or regulations of the court. Okay, so I'm out, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And as always, keep it 100. And we'll see you next time.